So back in chapter 9, we looked at electronegativity and looked at polar and nonpolar bonds. So elements that had a difference in electronegativity had a polar bond, which resulted from the un it resulted in the uneven sharing of electrons. Nonpolar, we had an even sharing of electrons. And they worked great when we were looking at a bond, but now we need to look at the entire molecule. So just as a refresher, let's look at this question. This should look familiar to you. So the correct answer is going to be the one that has the least polar molecule at the beginning, the most polar at the end. And what that allows us to do is actually to eliminate a couple of options. One, we can eliminate this first one because it has HF was a molecule. B and C both have FF, the fluorine. Those are two of the same elements, so it's going to be nonpolar. So we can eliminate D and E as well. And what we're going to be left with is either B or C. And what we have to decide is, is HF or HBr more or less polar? Remember that fluorine has the greatest electronegativity and bromine is going to have a lower electronegativity. So the difference between hydrogen and fluorine must be greater than the difference between hydrogen and bromine. So we have that C is our correct answer. So we're going to look very briefly at vectors. And you may have seen vectors in physics class. And vectors show us two things. They show us magnitude and they show us direction. So here we have a vector of 3 to the right, 7 to the right. We add those vectors together and we get 10. Same thing here, 10 and a minus 3, we get 7 and, and so on. Now imagine that the polar bond is represented by a vector. There's some magnitude of that, so the more polar, the bigger the magnitude of the vector, and then the direction, the way the electron density is shifting. Now imagine that we have a molecule that has multiple vectors because it has multiple polar bonds, and we want to see what the sum of those vectors is. So in this case, what we're seeing is we have vectors going here, down from to the left and going straight up. And we've just rearranged those vectors. The magnitude and the direction have not changed for these two. But what we see here with this red line is the sum of those two vectors. And if we look at those vectors that represent the polarity of a bond and we add those together, if we get a resultant vector, if it doesn't add to zero, then we know we have a polar molecule. If that vector adds to zero, then what we get is a nonpolar molecule. So a couple things that can help guide us. One, if we have only nonpolar bonds, then the molecule is nonpolar. There's nothing there to give it any polarity. If we have polar bonds, then we have to look at those vectors and imagine, are those polar bonds canceling out? Or are we going to be left with some resultant vector, in which case we're going to have a polar molecule? So we're just looking at the carbon-oxygen bond in CO2. Might help if you draw the Lewis structure, but is it polar or nonpolar? So what we want to look at is we'll draw the Lewis structure of CO2. And remember, I'm just looking at one of the bonds. I'm not looking at the overall molecule yet. We'll get to that in just a moment. But when I look at just that bond, I see that carbon and oxygen have different electronegativity values. Therefore, that will be a polar bond. Now what I have to look at is not just one of those bonds, but both of those bonds. And so what you see here at the bottom is a vector, okay, just a line with an arrow, that's representing the polarity of each bond. So we already said that the carbon-oxygen bond was polar because they have different electronegativity values. I know that oxygen is more polar, so we draw the line, or the arrow, pointing at the oxygen. Notice that we have the plus sign here on the left end because that's the less electronegative atom. So we know that bond is polar. We also know that the other carbon-oxygen bond is polar. And now we have these two vectors that will actually cancel out with one another. If I add these together, they will actually sum to zero. And as a result, I have no net dipole moment. So it's kind of like a tug-of-war game that nobody is winning. Now things change a little bit. This is actually HCN. So this is our Lewis structure for HCN. And what we see is that the carbon is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So we see our vector representing the dipole moment. So it's pointing to the right. We know that nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So it also is pointing to the right. And we aren't worried about the magnitude of these or the direction. What we're worried about is that this bond, 
is different than this bond, that they have different polarities because there are different differences in electronegativity between each pair of atoms. And so as a result, when we add these two together, so if we add these together, it does not equal zero. And because it doesn't equal zero, that says we have a polar molecule. So polar bonds and a polar molecule. Remember the CO2 also had polar bonds but was a nonpolar molecule. So this can continue on to our other geometries. We can apply it to any of them. When I look at our trigonal planar, for example, here we have three bonds that are all identical to one another. These will still cancel out. So we kind of imagine we're playing tug of war with three teams all evenly matched. Nobody's going to win. Nobody's going to lose. It's going to be a tie. This will be, in fact, a nonpolar molecule. On our other molecule over here, we see we have two bonds that are same and one is different. And it doesn't really matter whether these are less polar or more polar than the bond up here. What matters is that there's a difference in the polarity between our bond here and the bonds here. So now imagine we're playing tug of war, but we have one team that is much stronger than the other two teams, or one team that is much weaker. It doesn't matter which direction we go, but what we want to see is that there's some difference between them. And as a result, we'd see that this molecule is in fact polar because think of this as a tug of war game with three teams that are not evenly matched. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. We have a polar molecule. Here we have nonpolar, we have three perfectly evenly matched teams. So now let's look at a tetrahedral molecule. So now we have to kind of defy some physics and gravity issues and but what we want to look at is that the electronegativities of the atoms and the polarity of the bond. So this is a tetrahedral molecule. Remember these are not 90 degree angles, these are 109.5. So this is one of those cases where you need to be able to visualize what's going on in uh, the molecule, about how those atoms are arranged. So what we see here is that carbon and chlorine okay, have different electronegativities, so we have polar bonds, and so we have four of those bonds that are exactly alike. So do you think that's going to be polar or nonpolar? Now, when I look at the molecule on the right, I still see I have three carbon-chlorine bonds, but also this carbon-hydrogen bond. Notice that I still have three bonds that are the same, but I have one that's different. It really doesn't matter that this is pointing towards the carbon. It could, if it was a different atom and pointing away, it would still see the same thing, that not everything is canceling out. And as a result, we have a polar molecule. One thing to be careful of when we're looking at tetrahedral molecules is the Lewis structure. So if I wrote CH, we have two chlorines and two hydrogens. Remember, these Lewis structures give us the exact same information for the exact same molecule. And a common misconception is to say that this molecule is nonpolar here on the right and the molecule on the left is polar. But notice that Lewis structures show us connectivity, that regardless of which way I draw the Lewis structure, the bond angles are still 109.5. I always have to think about that geometry to understand the polarity of a molecule. Here we have a um, NH3 molecule. Remember NH3 also has a lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen. And so we see the same thing happening. Remember, this is still tetrahedral electron group geometry. And so we have the trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. So as a result, because those bond angles are still approximately 109.5, they're not canceling out with each other. So imagine we're looking at this molecule and one of our teams, we had four teams playing tug of war, and one of them walked away. And so what we see is a net dipole moment because these are not canceling out with each other because they are 109, roughly 100. 9.5 degrees from one another. So let's look at an example here. Which of the following molecules is nonpolar? And I want you to think about the Lewis structures and then move that into the geometry. So if we look at the Lewis structures of all these, what we're going to find is that C is the only one that is nonpolar. So we have boron trifluoride. This is actually violates the octet rule. But what we have are three groups, so we actually have trigonal planar geometry. HCN we saw earlier, um, CH2Cl2 we saw earlier. Remember, we have to, regardless of how we draw the Lewis structure, it still means the same thing. And if we look at OF2, it actually looks a lot like the structure of water.
where you have those lone pairs on oxygen. So our bond angle here is approximately 109.5, a little less than that. But what we see is that those bonds do not cancel out. So whether I draw it with the fluorines to the left and right, or showing it with the angles, these are still the same Lewis structures, regardless of how I draw it.